building, you know, cloud-based products, SaaS products. It's not necessarily super, you know, straightforward. There's a lot of variables to that. So we were very pleased to work with one of the leaders uh, and one of our partners, uh, Rackspace, in the crowd services industry and cloud applications industry to create a great panel uh, with Sean Anderson, who's the manager of data services at Rackspace, uh, leading a panel of great cloud entrepreneurs, all of whom are on our top company lists. And the subject today is how growth companies can leverage the evolution of the uh, cloud to build our businesses, because we're frankly largely all cloud-based businesses. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our our new friend, Sean Anderson of Rackspace and his illustrious group of CEOs in the cloud. Take it away, Sean. that introduction. Again, my name is Sean Anderson. I'm with Rackspace hosting. Wow, to, uh, to go after Ridley Scott, um, <laughs> Apple commercials is a little bit tough. I, I didn't know that, but uh, definitely a piece of this is this um, so again, my name is Sean Anderson. I'm with Rackspace hosting. I've been with Rackspace for oh, just over five years. Um, started when we were a managed hosting company. Uh, you but I've been with the company long enough to kind of weather through some of the transitions we've seen in the industry, moving from being a dedicated hosting company to start um, leveraging cloud services and also building cloud services uh, on a platform that we help measure the stack, focus on local standards and product development as a uniform platform. Um, so what I'd like to do today, and, and if I invited our, our great panel here, is to just kind of talk about the evolution of the cloud and one of the reasons I think that's increasingly important is um, there's a lot of hype and FUD around cloud technology, there's a lot of hype and FUD around big data and all of these kind of buzzwords there. And, um, increasingly, when we talk to customers, uh, we start to kind of actually level down into the reality of the situation. And, uh, you know, one of the terms that our CTO uses that, that I really think coins the conversation best is that um, the cloud is not for every application, and it's a journey. So what we actually see here at Rackspace is customers making strategic design choices and strategic decisions on when they start to port those applications in the cloud. Um, and what we'll get into a little bit later, too, as well, is sometimes we actually pull back to decisions and kind of leverage more legacy and traditional. Um, so I think there's a lot we can talk about. Each one of these panelists has navigated through all of the challenges and, and been successful in leveraging cloud technology. So um, I think they'll be able to give us some insight right there. So just real quickly about Rackspace, uh, what you'll see up here on the slide is what, uh, a recent work from Magic Quadrant that was uh, One thing at Rackspace that we pride ourselves on is that we're not just a hosting company. We coined a term called Fanatical Support. And what Fanatical Support means to us is we want to be known as a service company, just like Nordstrom and Southwest Airlines are known for the service that they deliver to their customers. We really believe that hosting in general is a commodity market expertise around hosting and guidance um, having a trusted partner is increasingly more valuable. Um, so this was kind of validated when Gartner released this new magic quadrant, naming us the leader on what they call managed cloud hosting or cloud enabled. This is a totally new um, quadrant and the people that you won't see on there are people like the Amazon Google's of the world that just provide um, so this kind of talks about a new sector of the business that kind of layers on um, some of the expertise and support aspects of the cloud. Uh, so we're really happy to see that validation from Gartner in this most recent report. Um, and generally what we do see for a majority of customers is that they can utilize a lot of the benefits that cloud hosting gives them. Uh, they benefit from scalability, uh, they can have ephemeral type of workloads that give them a really it's good it's good it's good it's good pricing. Uh, they can kind of shift their plans as they go uh, without having to really destroy a bunch of capex, capex investments in their banking. So specifically for startups, the agility and flexibility that allows them to move forward without kind of disrupting the flexibility. So, you know, kind of based off of that, you know, I want to go 
straight into the questions here, um, and uh, specifically on our first one, um, you know, we saw some of the benefits in the cloud right there, um, and I think that that's not particularly you know, a very controversial subject, uh, but you know, the, the cloud has allowed us to kind of scale outside of these paradigms of single server environments, creating entire environments in the cloud, um, and has allowed us to kind of meet the demand. Um, so I'd like to pose the first question uh, to Alex. Uh, and, and actually first, Alex, uh, cross with Peter. Guys introduce yourself and explain a little bit about what you do um, and, and how you guys have learned to play Sure. Hi, I'm Alex Filosi. I did a presentation yesterday. And my company, Marvel Online, is a solution for engagement and analytics uh, with the mission to get people's opinions around the world of any topic quickly with a high quality, with the ability to conclude something meaningful out of collected data. So imagine different sites in different languages around the world using our modules to ask people questions, engage them in debates, run quizzes, and return back really interesting results. So you can compare yourself to other people and also provide really great analytics for publishers and their partners behind the scenes so they can learn better about the audience and serve them better, better content, better advertisement, and better roadmaps. So that's what OneWorld is about. And my previous companies also were using cloud solutions before they became as mature Reliable as the and talk about this during the first question. You've seen it all, great. Yeah, I've seen the bad and the good and the ugly, and especially before they started calling the cloud. It was a very popular abbreviation, NOC, NOC. Yeah, build the NOC was a whole story of the song. Every time build the NOC was like a fire drill or some kind of major challenge for the whole company, you didn't need to sleep back then. You just perfectly find a way to have a Exercise. Exercise. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hi, I'm uh, Manav, the founder and CEO of Instar Project. We are a SaaS company in the application building space. And our customers are leading online businesses. So that's like e commerce, online gaming companies, leading SaaS vendors, private hospitality companies. And the common theme across all these companies is that their business and their revenue depends on performance. So we work with these companies and we make sure that their sites and their apps load really, really fast, as fast as possible for all their users across all devices. And we are disrupting this uh, space of legacy incumbents called content delivery networks, CDNs. This is a space that frankly has seen no innovation in the last decade. That's what we're changing. Since you kind of started with the market online, so I oh, really? quite understand that. Oh, um, uh, oh, really? Uh, anyway, my name is David. I'm at a company called Expensify. We do extension boards that don't suck. And it's a bold vision, but we're improving the world one extension board at a time. Excellent. Also the best dressed guy in technology. <laughs> Glad to have <laughs> you on said. the panel. <laughs> um, so, again, you know, we'd be placating you guys if we you know, sat here and just pounded on the benefits of cloud. But I think you know, diving down into reality and some of the challenges that you've seen is a little bit more interesting since you guys have been on the front lines of this. And just because I'm OCD and I like Repetition. We'll start with you, Alex. So, um, you know, my question is simply: What are you seeing as common issues users are facing when they aim to scale their applications outside of a cloud? No, this is not an issue. How do they do that through mobile and social platforms? What are some of the pain points and obstacles that you see out there? Yeah, just to put it in context, like I mentioned. Аксель. <laughs> Да, озвучь нам за всех Latency or slow loading, whether 
system experience. So it's really tough actually because it could be a different factors in the picture. And so from my point of view, from business perspective, the best infrastructure is the one that I don't know. It just exists on its own, it does the job, and every time I grow my customer base, it just happens, right? Magically. Reality is much closer to this today than it used to be in the early 2000, but it's still not quite there, right? Because you still need to have some dashboarding, some monitoring tools, performance tools to see what's happening actually. And this year we're going through the hockey stick growth, including international. So I, I see this live on the Imagine this, in our office, everybody is running Google Analytics, some dashboards against our service. Probably half of the companies do that because everybody really cares about what's happening. We see this change in traffic between morning and midday because, for example, US is active and it goes to sleep, South America picking up, and some point of Asia and Europe all roll out. But also, it depends on time of the day and day of the week and so on. So, monitoring, I think, is the next big challenge and next big thing that everybody should be really paying attention. Let's say we have a good dashboard and a good metrics to monitor what's going on. That's why it's so intriguing the performance, the performance you're making. Because I keep hearing it from my customers all the time. I want your load time to be in milliseconds, not seconds. I want the latency to be that. I want all kind of good things. So it translates to me. Make sure that performance is there, the monitoring tools are enabled, and the, also the geolocations are covered. Because when you go from, especially from country to country, that always includes some challenges, like location servers and so on. And I think overall, Amazon and Netflix and other partners are beginning to do a good job on this one. But there's still some planning in the world which is How to achieve the scalability by combining best practices but also some forward movement. Actually, to jump in there a little bit, <coughs> I did a graphic and the shifting, uh, like free populating caches and things like this and this on the planet and so forth. And I, I agree, I think that when it comes, I think cloud services are especially good. Like cloud infrastructure is really great if you want to spin up a server in Asia and have to fly there. So I think that, yeah, as, as applications become more global in nature, I think these, these topics certainly become much more interesting than they have in the past. Just to double click on what you said, Alex, you know, about kind of the, uh, the slow user experience. How damaging is it when you're delivering? Poor experience to your customers. Maybe that's based on infrastructure, maybe it's application performance. Uh, but what, what does that look like? I imagine that's a pretty pervasive problem. Yeah, it is. And that's something you have to pay attention from the very beginning. Because usually partners want to do trials, do some tests, and you usually go to some part of the environment because they're not enable the whole site, but a few pages of information to understand what's going on. There's a big difference between test mode and production mode, right? When you see real traffic. is very low. If somebody see a page loading for more than two seconds, and this will also page loading for two seconds, that's perfect. Much is still perfect. That's a logical area. But it also diagnosed the problems with application. Of course, I agree with you. That's a, that's a big deal. And a lot of companies try to optimize it. It's international uh, mobile cache. Because that's not really the case. Even Amazon, they scale their service in different parts of the world slightly differently. Right? So, uh, I'm sure that other companies can see it. And maybe forward to some of the other questions. That's why it might be a really need to not put all the eggs in one basket, but have more interesting solution where those how the speech from one environment to another and for parts of the system. So back up. Nav, I know you deliver that experience to yes. customers, so you probably see those wrong. Right. I imagine they don't take it kindly when you go to Twitter and explain yeah, how strong it is. Yeah, so this is something you just see all day long, every day. And you know there's a lot of published third party data on this from some very reputable sources. So Walmart recently published this report, and that said that for every 100 milliseconds delay in their page load, they lost about 1% of the time. And this problem that we are talking about is actually gets even further compounded and aggravated by the use of mobile devices. Right? So on mobile devices, you're typically on a very on a type of a wireless network. Caching content all over the world doesn't really help. No, because it only takes it to the edge, but the real bottleneck is on this 3G, 4G, or Wi-Fi connection that the device is talking on. And on mobile, whether you like it or not, users expect actually a faster experience than on the desktop. Right? The one habit is more limited, but the user expectations are actually higher. And that just really kills a lot of people. We're demanding creatures when it comes to our mobile. <laughs>
everybody else. So, so to move on, um, I wanted to put this up on the screen. Um, this was a tweet that um, I thought was especially interesting out of Microsoft. Um, talking about how their client server business has grown 19% over the last year. Um, and when we all entered into this industry, we really believed that um, you know, it's going to kind of cannibalize the traditional server model. What we're actually seeing is both technologies continue to grow. Uh, so that kind of leads me into my next question. Um, we, we all sit here and we can kind of articulate advantages of cloud. Um, but when would we recommend not using cloud? What are some of the use cases and some of the workloads where it still just makes sense to kind of land on either legacy infrastructure or other types of technology? Um, and I want to throw that over to you, David, first. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I think that actually Alex hit on one, and that is uh, the notion of diversity. I'd right? say, so, like, having um, high uptime requires just having a variety of, like, fallbacks and so forth, and not having yourself locked into a single provider is key. I would say, um, being able to have, um, uh, like, like Amazon or whatever, it's like, they sound really great, except their, their performance is good, but their uptime is actually terrible. It's like, if you, if you ran your website or whatever service out of a single availability zone on Amazon, you'd suffer a lot. But if having, like, multiple providers, be it Amazon and Rackspace, or having a dedicated servers, or even better, I'd say, like, uh, uh, sometimes for some services, owning your own service would help. Maybe a second one I would say is, but the second one would be cost. If you have a really predictable and even load, uh, you're not really getting a lot of advantage, the cost advantage of the cloud. Because if you know exactly how much hardware you need, it's better just to buy it and then you just pay power rather than paying by the hour. Uh, and so I'd say like maybe diversity, cost, and then maybe a third one is probably like compliance. Uh, like with Expensify, we deal, you know, we do expense reporting, we deal uh, with tons of public companies who process billions of dollars in transactions. Um, and so as you can imagine, you know, uh, the government's all up in our business, the banks are, and so forth. So they have a lot of, they're not always the most savvy of creatures out there, I would say. Uh, and so if we say that we're hosting on a particular provider, they're like, well, yeah, that provider sounds great, but they're not on this list. And this, this list was made in 1982, and they're just not on it yet. Um, and it's like, well, I guess, you know, if you want this license, you've got to be on the list, sorry. Um, and so I think that compliance when dealing with uh, a lot of sort of antiquated partners, I think is um, kind of a big deal. And, uh, and I think that cloud can, uh, can be sort of a hindrance often in the compliance discussion. So I guess I had to pick three, I'd say, um, diversity in order to achieve high uptime, um, sort of cost when there's predictable load, and then compliance when dealing with the agent. Такие дырявые кеды поношены этого выступающего. Как это некрасиво выглядит на таких коричневых носках. Многих не завернул куда-то. Все время ему крутит ногами. Yeah, so I guess I have some personal experience with this particular started the company. For us, it was the kind of service we provide. We need to have servers deployed in different parts of the world. Everything is fully redundant. Uptime, as David mentioned, is very important for us to provide to our customers. But our initial, in our initial version, all of our servers were running in the cloud. All of our banking services were running in the cloud. <coughs> and I'm a big believer in cloud future, but ultimately, we ended up you know, taking a lot of these services outside of the cloud. We spun up physical servers, managed them, just like us. Yeah. yeah. So we started running these services on these servers, set up a whole lot of but we started really managing all of that. And one of the big reasons for that was we feel that most of the clouds or any of the clouds today, they don't provide a good enough control on the networking infrastructure. Right? So if you want to do something, like let's use the AnyCast protocol for doing some, some nice load balancing or diffusion VROS take up attempts, there's just no good way to do that. So those are some key capabilities that are lacking in cloud today. That's a great point. Um, and kind of rounding things up here, you know, I was able to kind of review everybody's websites, learn more about the businesses, and great experience here. Um, you know, Manav, on your website, I really love a term that's coined there that says relying on intelligent software to solve the most difficult challenges. So my first thought is intelligent software, what does that mean? Does that mean we're closer to Skynet? Really scary <laughs> things that keep you up at night. Um, but that's kind of an interesting concept to me because traditionally we would have you know, infrastructure architecture, architecture and we would design applications to play well with that architecture. But now that we have so many standards that span across cloud technology, we have uh, so many things that we can predict, applications are actually starting to influence the underlying cloud architecture and scale it and grow it in a way that's pretty seamless. Um, so, um, you know, in your mind, how are applications changing to influence the Structure design, um, and are they causing these older environments to come up? Yes, 
So I guess the answer to the second question is yes, they're causing water to go to completely cause the older environments to become obsolete. So the change that we are seeing or we have seen is that you know, earlier we had these applications that we used to have basically a perimeter of servers inside a perimeter or servers that were inside a perimeter, right? And these applications could scale and then you surrounded these servers by like a layer of load balancers. And then you surrounded that by like a layer of firewalls and so on and so forth, right? But these applications, you know, they were designed to run on these servers, execute, generate some code, generate some content, just fairly static and push it out to the end users. But now what we are seeing is very personalized, very sophisticated cloud applications which have a fairly component, a fairly non-trivial, sophisticated client-side component, thanks to all the rich browsers and the high capability client suite, right? So what we have now is part of the application that runs on these servers and part of the application that runs within these browsers or this client. And we have all these services, these application infrastructure type services, like the load balancers and security solutions that work really well for the server side of the server part of the application, but they do nothing for the client side of the application. And that's you know that's something that part of the application is in a market. Um just wanted to end here with kind of a rapid fire question. We're talking about the evolution of cloud, we're talking about the cloud um, But what's next? If we continue to evolve, what are your users excited about? What are your developers excited about? Maybe I'll start off with David. And what's the next buzzword? Something a little bit more realistic. That's tough. Man. I wish I thought about this ahead of time. I'm going to pass. I'm going to come back. I'm going to have Great. something amazing in about 30 seconds. No problem. I do something not amazing with not <laughs> with no time, right? Uh, so, what we think, you know, what, when we talk to people and talk to our customers and see some trends, something interesting which seems to be shaping up is this whole advent of hybrid clouds. And, you know, this cloud brokerage type services and the ability to take our workload from one cloud and run it on some other cloud or have a distributed, really truly distributed application, part of which runs on one cloud, part of which uh, runs on the other cloud, and you can dynamically compose these different cloud services together. And that is super interesting in my mind, because I think that is going to cause a lot of problem for these legacy applications. Make this assumption that the applications are in some contained, isolated part that you can tie a string around. That's something that we see. Yeah, from my point of view, it's not really exciting that we have to do this, but it's something all collectively should be a lot of attention for this cloud services to be successful. What I see in my realm, the engagement, audience, and in people's opinion, is that there's more and more regulation requirements from some countries, like for example, Eastern Europe and Western Europe, that information about people should be kept within the country. And it's become really complex because imagine this, if people are more anonymous, that's less of a problem. What if they use their Facebook, login account, Twitter, Google Plus, register and vote on certain issues? And then it's become really blurry, right? Because you can have part of information one country, other part of another country. And trying to build a system that takes into consideration all these restrictions, but still usable, delivers the value, and so on, is very challenging. So I think, in addition to the diversity, which we discussed a little bit, we should really think about the security, partition of data, access to data, the way that not only customers are happy, but to comply with these regulations and have a visible story. I see that the challenge for the global applications like ours and what is that one world. Because some countries are really easy to deal with and some countries are already difficult to become difficult. So that's I think the concern of mine. If you really want to have a global solution, you really need to take into consideration. Data governance and such seems to be a really hot topic and I think that um, it's interesting when ethics and morality start coming. You also said analytics earlier. So that's right. Data is the new oil, as they say. And I guess for my amazing answer, which was probably a little bit oversold, um, I, don't, I actually don't know that there's a next big thing. There's not always a next big thing, I guess I would say. I think more, the next big thing is going to be we're just filling in the gaps more and more. And I think that, um, that these services become so reliable and so ubiquitous that they become like utility power. We're still not to that point. Like, we trust that the power is like almost always on this country. It's like, Always great. The internet is, is usually on. It's like, yes, yeah, with high, high, high reliability, it's on. And then the website's on the internet, it's like, yeah, they're sometimes on. And it's great. And I think that uh, we're still kind of building that up from the bottom. It's like, you have to have really awesome power to it. Like, the internet's getting to a point where it's like, yeah, it's always there, it's always on my phone. Um, and, uh, and like, the data it knows everything about me and so forth. I think, like, uh, the future is going to be more things like Google Map. It's going to be um, applications that fall into the background. Like I would say, one of our dreams for Expensify um, is 
because there's expense reporting. Like, let's be honest. So, like, we don't we don't suck, but it's still not fun. It's like yeah, everyone hates their expense reporting. There's no there's no way to get around that. And so our our dream for Expensify is that we're the product that you never ever use. That you set it up once, and then we just take care of everything for you. Just take a picture. We'll just do everything else for you. So I think that like our design ethos is we want you to come to our product as infrequently as necessary and leave as fast as possible. Um, and I think that over time that sort of design ethos is going to be for everyone, where it's it's not about um, something new. It's about basically just getting out of the way, always being there, being so reliable that everyone just forgets it. I think that's the next thing. Please make that happen. We're <laughs> working on it. Uh, so, great panel today. I want to thank you guys. Um, great conversation. I want to kind of open it up now to any questions from the audience. I think we have some microphones floating around. Uh, specifically for our panelists, guys. Happen to the wealth of knowledge. Thank you. 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 Thank really mature on cloud on the cloud environment. Uh, can you <coughs> throw some more light on that? So uh, what I said was that as applications start running across different cloud services, then you know there are basic principles and load balancers work against, which are not going to be that sufficient. So when you do load balancing across the clouds today, you typically use some sort of a DNS based load balancer. And it's generally not as reliable, it's not as fast to respond. And it doesn't really have the same reliability or enterprise grade readiness to it that your typical EDC does. Right? So that's an example of services that you know, are basically stretching for the kind of deployment models you have to and not really Does that answer your question? He's going to hit his Nike. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, in my company, when we started out, uh, we were using managed hosting, and then we moved into um, a cloud provider, looking up on a cloud provider. Um, and what sort of happened was our costs started skyrocketing, um, basically because the nodes I wanted to create for dev um, far exceeded what I was using. So I went into a study to figure out, well, where's the cost going? What's I really paying for with a uh, cloud provider? And what I kind of came to the conclusion was that I'm paying not only a managed hosting fee, but I'm also paying additional fat on top of that. And if you think about virtualization and the, and the creation of cloud, it's really because CPUs and RAM has gotten so cheap that it's, you know, it can power these things. There's so much extra CPU power out there. So um, so I did some quick analysis, and I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, well, cloud providers aren't buying the fastest drives on the planet. They're not buying the fastest CPUs. They're not buying the fastest RAM. Plus, I'm thrown into a box, probably oversubscribed with noise and aim for problems and everything else. So I, I went out and I spiked my own hardware. And in the day when you can buy a, you know, a, a box with 256 gigs of RAM, 24 cores with three and a half gigahertz, uh, you need a tremendous amount of power on that. So, I guess all wisdom, I went, I now run my own cage, my own rack, and it was 10 months of cost of paying a, when I was paying for the to buy all my own hardware. And, um, you know, application stability has gone up. I have total control over everything. And I kind of, you know, wonder, am I doing something wrong? I mean, I was not using Amazon, so I realized there's, you know, other controls and pieces of there, but, you know, I still run my own virtualization, you know, I run my own dev box, so I get an infinite number of, you know, dev and some of production just screams. And because the cost is so low, you know, so while cloud costs are going up, hardware costs is, you know, it's racing to zero. So, you know, for me, the solution is build my own cloud cloud. I use, you know, fully optimized hardware, you know, for, you know um, down to the metal, and every single phone, and I now have total control. Um, so, is, uh, is I just worked with the wrong partners before? Or do you guys think, you know, because nobody ever talks about the cost of the cloud. 
yeah, sure, it's going to be a push of money. I get more notes, I'm going to spun up every more day. But what do you really think? For? What is it? You know, and he, he thinks of, you know, complications of history. And I'm used to fathers. I'm used to freedom. I'm used to, you know, it's been a cycle for the process of the memory for a So, um, so I just find this very necessary as a point of reaction. You, sir, are not alone. So if you look at, like, heavily regulated industries, specifically, they can't live. So I'd say that uh, once the cloud cleared of kind of hype around those technologies, then we get to the reality of that. I think a lot of users are saying. Uh, do you guys have any comments on, on that? We didn't really touch on price. Yeah, well, I would say uh, in a situation where uh, you can provision hardware, and you're willing to pay for that hardware 24-7, uh, I think that owning your own hardware is great. I think a situation where it's not going to be processed in millions and millions of receipts all the time. And they, and they come in spikes, like April 15th is like a rough day. And so um, you, uh, so therefore, but we don't always want to pay for like April 15th hardware on every other day of the year. Uh, and so I think that having the ability to, to scale up and down um, is great. And so I, I, I think cloud is really awesome for situations where you have unpredictable demand. Um, uh, because then the cost advantage of your own hardware actually kind of goes away. Uh, and so I think that's like the, the main thing. Yeah, I would just second that. I think utilization. Is a very important thing to factor in when considering the economies of course, running some workload on the cloud or buying their own servers. Like the cash flow, those are the two important things. You know, it may make a different kind of a sense of different levels of situation as to what to decide to do with that. Yeah, for me, very simple comment that you only can compare about physical right and physical wrong. That's how you measure everything. Because in physical right, of course, it's much cheaper and better. But what if things go wrong? This time is going to be assigned to troubleshoot and solve the problem. Because that's, I think, is a reliable most thing. That's meant there. So <laughs> I want to thank my panel today. Uh, you're up next. <laughs> that's right. Just getting started. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, I'm David from, from Expensify. Um, we do expense reporting, uh, business service for travelers. Um, and uh, but I'm actually not here to talk about expensi or Expensify today. Um, contrary to popular belief, we're actually not raising. We're profitable. We're growing. Everything's great. So I'm here on a public service campaign to help educate the world as to the problem of the cult of CAC. So CAC, for everyone I'm sure in the room, recognizes that a. Uh, CAC stands for the cost of customer acquisition, the cost to acquire a customer or something, I'm not sure of that. And I'd say it's, it's become sort of synonymous with raising money. It's like basically justifying a company by like the cost of customer acquisition and lifetime value. And my theory, and this is what I'm here to talk about, is this is actually ruining our economy. But to step back a bit, I'm going to like rewind the clock, if you will, back to uh, the early days of the dot-com, where uh, sort of the, 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 the peak of dot-com boom. Uh, everybody's business model uh, looks a little something like this. Uh, basically, you know, I think South Park really got it right. And basically, step one is you collect eyeballs. You know, just get people to your website, however, at whatever cost. Step two, something happens. And then step three, profit. It's going to be great. And, uh, and now we look back, we're like, ah, those guys. Eyes are so silly. What are they thinking? Of course, eyeballs don't make money by themselves. You have to do something with them. It's like, oh man, those guys are hilarious. Like, uh, the old, it's like, what were they thinking? Now the new business model, the new enterprise, is, is much more solid. And then, and then, and then something happens. Right? It's so much better, right? Like, actually, I don't, I don't know. I kind of feel like we've, we've traded one world for another one. I think there's another, another uh, a skit from Saturday Night Live that I really love. Uh, it's actually called the Change Bank. I don't know if anyone remembers this one. Basically, it works like this. Uh, the change bank is a bank where you go and you can change. And so it's like you have a dollar. You can go in there and walk out with, uh, you know, 10 dots, like four quarters, 20. It is, whatever it is. And it's like, you know, the question is, how does the change bank make money? One word. Volume. It's like, well, it doesn't make any sense, of course. We laugh at that, but actually, when we look at all the enterprise companies out there right now, and they're either losing money 
or barely squeaking by. And how does it It's like, how does that really work? And I would say, we call it kind of the room model. Like with room, room, like, you know, when you have multiple of your revenue and your revenue multiple. And revenue multiple is almost always just the increase in revenue. Over time. That means that your revenue or the evaluation is simply how much you're making per versus your growth. And it's like, you know, your revenue times your revenue growth. And it's like, okay, how do you know future revenue growth? And I simply, of course, the way they sell is the product to all of your problems. Uh, is that all growth comes by spending money. Uh, because basically the only way you can get new customers is to buy them. So that means your future growth is exactly equal to how much money you have and the ROI to spend and divided by one year because, because no one thinks about one year. Uh, and so that means that your valuation as an enterprise company is always equal to your revenue all the time. Uh, and this is the Otherwise, we're starting to things start to go. Can't even possibly run the business without having these two ver your lifetime, like a, a non-contract basis, the whole world going to. It's like it's your, your lifetime value is over such a long period of time. It's like it generally the contract lifetimes are larger than like the, the lifetime of your entire company. So you can't possibly actually measure this in any statistically. Relevant ways. So you kind of estimated the churn. And then for the cost of customer acquisition, that's really two things. It's your cost. Because, like any enterprise, that's going to be, of course, you have to have a computer times 0.15 for your commission sales force. It's your cost of sale. Okay. How much of your marketing can you attribute to that sale? Plus, what's the, where things get really crazy, though, because everyone's like, yeah, cost of customer. Uh, at at box.net, the employee number two, and I talked for like an hour about, like, hey, where do you buy your leads? How does that work? And so forth. They talked for so long about how we, like, oh, the AB test and everything, everything's totally quantified, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, that's really great. That's really great. And then I, as we're sort of standing up, almost we're done, like, we're kind of walking in the room. I ask them, oh, oh did that. He's like, oh, for revenue, we have no idea where it comes from. The overwhelming thing says that whatever. I'm like, oh, that's really crazy. <clears throat> then I ask around, everyone works this way. Like, I can't, it's almost a pump. Also, to find a business that doesn't work this way. Like, I was talking with, you know, Brandon Biedenbaum, like the original SVP of, like, some kind uh, of sales work, like, huh? Like, what do you raise? Like, what do you? When they uh, uh, went public, they actually raised very little money. And the only reason they switched away from sort of activity-based pricing over to content is because they couldn't raise money. That's the whole uh, the economy is collapsing. And so they're looking like uh, uh, Brad Smith over into it. That's um, uh, the parking doesn't work, period. Uh, we, we came out with QuickBooks. Um, we put it in shelves. No one bought it. Instead, we just pre-packaged And then Quicken users basically uh, gave it to their uh, accountants. Uh, and then the accountants basically used it after that. But, like, there's no way to buy accountants because they're tech savvy, uh, but actually uh, 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 risk averse. It's like, it's not possible. It's like, it's just like Dropbox works in the same way. It's like, they have no idea. The company, the, like, the only. I think the most interesting company is Classic and they used to time they're doing, no. Our entire advertising budget, people advertising every $16 million. Um, $16 million and $500 million in revenue. I'm like, what? Well, that's pretty interesting. So, oh, yeah, what's well, more It's more interesting. It's going down. It used to be a ton more. But then we realized we have no idea if this works at all. Half again, nothing happened. You were a turn. Basically, every company I look at love is this really, you know, refined, uh, a genius company with, you know, really a. Uh, uh, Perfect models, like nobody has any idea where the marketing money goes, and that's just the way it is. But, but for some reason, this this reality, this what 
seal the truth is just somehow not made it into the group model of evaluations. Because if we go back to it's like ROI, it seems like it's a very simple thing, right? LTV, CCC, I see what can go wrong. But in reality, it's just really fucking complicated formula that no one believes, especially because the two most important attributes of this formula are completely unquantifiable. It's like churn, and you're not, not uh, how much you have, you're not a trivial rep or uh, advertising spend to attribute to your sales. Like, that's totally impossible. But even worse, both are both entirely outside of your actually control. And so, uh, whereas uh, in theory, you know, your value, your valuation is this revenue.